Um, so I'll start off this way. Um, you know, how to give you a quick background. It's interesting. We'll kind of start with with the market and and kind of my thoughts around what's happening because this is this is the same and different all at the same time of what we're experiencing. Um, in the sense that Remax has been around 47 years, been through six recessions, this is the seventh, and we have a proven brand and a proven business model and proven the fact that the uh, average Remax agent sells two or three to one of everyone else. And our business model has worked on every side of every real estate market in the last five decades. And I've been asked a lot of questions about in the last couple of years because I was an executive at Zillow um, in fact, last time I saw many of you, uh, I came to your office and spoke to you a little bit. And I think I was with Zillow at the time. Um, that was, gosh, Howdy, what was that? Three years ago, four years ago, maybe? It's been a few. And uh, I, I get asked a lot of questions about, is the agent less relevant? Um, is the agent going to be disintermediated? Is technology going to take our jobs? And true story, four weeks ago, I had an agent on a similar session to this say, with all this technology that we're using, is the agent gonna be less relevant moving forward? And I said, absolutely not. 100% no. The agent is the most important part of a transaction. And I can tell you for even my closing that happened last week, and it was a 60 day closing because the, the timing of the buyer being in a lease, um, that transaction, especially with everything going on, would not have closed if there weren't real estate agents on both sides of the deal. And by the way, it was one of those deals that I should have got paid on both sides because I basically did the job of the other agent. How many of you have had that happen? Literally, day before closing, the assistant says, hey, I can't get a hold of, of uh, my agent. She's his assistant. Um, I need a couple of documents in order for us to finish the closing. Could you help me? Um, he was nowhere to be found. And so it just, you know, it goes to show that the professionalism of an agent can make the difference in a transaction. Um, but I said, here's the part that's going to sting. And Hadi knows I'm pretty direct. So um, uh, take this for the spirit in which it's intended. No, tech isn't going to replace you. However, if we were really being honest with ourselves, some of this technology that we're being forced to use today we should have been using before. We really should have. And here's the one thing we have to keep in mind coming out of this. Pick one or two things to learn and put in your business for efficiency. Consumers got trained on technology just as much as we did during this time. My wife had never used Zoom. She had never used video conferencing. Um, and she's a very bright lady, uh, but she just didn't have a need to in her life. And now, She's using video conferencing and web conferencing to chat with her friends and happy hour with our friends. And um, now all of a sudden she's comfortable getting behind the camera um, and using this technology to interface with people that she knows. So this pandemic trained consumers about technology too, not just us. And therefore there's gonna be an expectation of how we best utilize some of this in our business. So. The one thing I, we got some we got someone hot out there, um, but the one thing is this: don't furlough yourselves. Do not furlough yourselves right now. There are a number of things that, even though the limitations um, by state on how essential real estate is, and if you can do showings, if you if you can close, that all varies. Um, and I'm a big data guy. I've been watching data on every single state and country since this started. Um, and I'll get into this and share uh, why I'm so optimistic on the market um, and where I think things are going to end up, not only in the next 60 to 90 days, but for year end, if you're curious. Uh, but you can grow your business in the most difficult times. Um, and here's a stat for you. 10 years ago, when we had the downturn, any of you licensed? 10 years ago, 07, 8, 9, 10, you were selling real estate then. Um, this is very different than, than that, than that uh, circumstance because real estate led us into that recession. Real estate obviously didn't re lead us into this one, 
But I will tell you what, mark my words, I truly believe that real estate is going to be the, one of the main industries that leads our country out of it. And so it's different. However, we had 1.4 million realtors going into the Great Recession. That dropped to 900 and some thousand. We lost 34% of licensed realtors in the U.S. in a three-year period of time. We are back to 1.4 million. There are over 50% of the agents that are licensed in our business now that have never seen a buyer's market and never experienced a downturn. That's wild. Over 50%, over half of the agents in our country have never experienced <clears throat> a change in the market, a significant change. Um, all the data, and I'll get into it, we're not going back into a buyer's market. I believe we're going to continue to be in a seller's market for the rest of the year. And of course, into 21, because there's going to be so many divorces and kids that come out of all of this, uh, we're going to be good next year needing to sell a lot of houses. Anyway, so talking about this, tough times don't last, but tough people do. Um, and this is where I encourage you to stay focused. January, February, February, March was one of the strongest first quarters that real estate has seen in over 13 years. Um, most companies, most areas of the country, and you know how it's local. Raleigh is different than, I mean, it's hyper-local. Uh, Raleigh's different than Charlotte. You can go within one city and the north side is different than the south. So I'm going to be talking, you know, big, big swings within just the U.S., but overall, um, real estate was on average in most markets, even in February, uh, 130% year over year. And so it's the strongest pre-spring season we've seen in decades in the business, um, which is good. Um, demand is very, very high, uh, and it, it continues to be. However, the thing that uh, I, I started talking about a month ago, and if you've heard me talk about this, like on Good Morning Remax or, or in another meeting, forgive me, but I'm, it's worth mentioning. Uh, I think Jack Canfield, he's the author, Chicken Soup for the Soul, Success Principles, if you've heard of him. He has a success formula, and it's E plus R equals O. Events plus responses equal outcomes. And if you're interested in kind of reading more, if you just Google Jack Canfield success formula, he has one page online that goes into detail on this. But the, the whole premise of it is this. He tried to figure out what makes someone successful and other people not successful. And it was for business and personal. And his formula is that the event plus the response equals the outcome, that the difference in unsuccessful people and successful people is they realize that they strive to outcomes or if they don't like the outcomes in your life. I, I don't like my income. I want it higher. Um, I don't like my job. I don't like my spouse. Uh, that those are all the outcomes. Unsuccessful people blame the event. Well, I don't like my spouse because she's X. I don't like my income because X. I don't like my boss. And they blame the event. In his mind, successful people realize that if they don't like the outcome or they want to change the outcome in their life, they have to change their response. They don't blame the event. And it just hit me about a month ago that everything that's going on in our world with this pandemic is the event. And we can all do our part, which we're all trying to do, stay at home and distance, and, uh, but yet we can't control the event. Um, we can get, some people are so stressed out, they're having panic attacks. Um, we unfortunately had an employee that she just hit a tipping point this last week and ended up in the ER having a panic attack. Stress level is way up here. And then you see other people that are very, very calm, optimistic, focusing on what they can, um, and that's the response. So as much as we can, we worry about the things that we typically can't control. Um, when you have anxiety, and I had an exercise that someone did for me, a mentor of mine over 20 years ago, and I was all spun up about this project I was working on. And he looked over at me and he said, write down quick everything you're worried about. And I wrote them all down. And then he said, how many of those things can you control? And I said, virtually none. 
And he said, so what can you control in this project? And I went through it. And he said, that's where you focus. Focus on what you can control, not what you can't control, and it'll help keep your head right. So leading indicators, by the way. Um, if you want to see, in fact, I think I can do this. Here's a fun one. Um, showings are the leading indicator of pendings under contracts and obviously what leads to close. Have any of you seen this map? Go to showingtime.com and they actually are tracking showing activity. So when all of this started up here, we started watching this showing activity and forecasting on when the when is the bottom of pendings. Now, and we all can agree, the most frustrating part when we started going into this is when you can't see the finish line, you gotta be careful how fast you run the race. And we couldn't see the finish line, we didn't know. Is this a 3K, is it a 5K, or is this a full 26 mile marathon? We didn't know and it was driving us crazy. I think everyone's getting more comfortable, I've seen in the last week or so, because it feels even though there's still a lot of uncertainty, um, that there is somewhat a level of a finish line um, as things start to open and progress. But even check this out, look at showings here. Um, keep in mind, I told you what January, February, March were um, historic quarters. And so these showings here from January, you look, we're all up year over year, 11%, 12%. Um, and then obviously this changed on March 12th. You look at where showings are right now for the state. Uh, weekly average is up 31.7%, but the 20, uh, oh, for uh, 2019 weekly average, but the 2020 weekly average is plus 5.1, but we're back at the showing levels in North Carolina that we started at the first part of the year. And so just since right here, what date is that? April 2nd, April 3rd, Look at how much that's resumed. It's an awesome leading indicator. Awesome, awesome, awesome. And so March ended up some of the best months for agents and brokerages. So here's what we forecast. Um, coming into May, I personally believe, and even though every market's local, when we look at North Carolina as, uh, as an example, um, that the very bottom of closings is going to be the last two weeks of May and the first week of June. It's going to be the lightest three weeks of closing activity. Um, and because of the showing activity that started coming into April and May, then we're going to see a huge uptick uh, in closing starting in the second half of June and July, when usually that's April, May. All we did is take our spring market and we're gonna bump it 60 days, but unfortunately we've got that rock bottom of three weeks. Um, so that's what we're forecasting, um, especially for you. This NAR Pulse Survey, I love this. They did this flash survey um, April 12th, 13th, that they asked agents, what are your buyers and sellers feeling? Only 12% as of mid-April, and keep in mind, that was probably the height of the lockdown and not knowing the finish line. Only 12% said, I'm out not doing this. 88% of buyers said, I'm still in, interested in buying. And I think that there's a percentage of that 12 that opted out that will likely even come back. 60% though said that they're just gonna delay the process for a couple of months. And keep in mind this, millennials, largest demographic buying houses. Millennials, biggest population the US has ever seen, bigger than the baby boomers. We had 4.3 million homes for sale in the Great Recession. We had 1.3 million going into this. And on average, we dropped 27% in inventory across the country and some markets dropped by 40 to 50%. Inventory levels, low, low. Um, I love when the economists, by the way, that don't know our business forecasted a decline in prices in March. Wrong, we went up 1.2%. Um, and so uh, we believe because of low inventory, prices are gonna continue to creep up in low single digits um, for this entire year. Check this out, sellers. 
Only 10% said I'm not going to list, but 57% said they're going to delay the process by a couple of months. And so we have pent up spring inventory that hasn't yet hit the market that we need desperately um, because we're still seeing bidding wars in certain price ranges. And so we believe that we have a lot of listings that we're going to see come on the market starting this month and next month. Um, this is interesting though. We do have to adjust to new seller expectations. Open houses, we're not gonna see those for a while, for sure. I don't believe we're going to see, you know, and how many of us do open houses in November, December anyway? I don't think open houses are gonna be a thing for the rest of the year, um, it, except virtually. Um, but look at the sanitizer, shoes, all of those things. That is going to be our norm. By the way, I had the best day of my life yesterday. I got a haircut yesterday afternoon because we're open in Colorado. I'll tell you what, I don't smoke, but I almost needed a cigarette after that. It was so satisfying. Um, but I had to have a mask to have my haircut. It was the strangest thing. But, you know, that's just kind of the reality of how we're going to work and showings are going to be the same way. Um, we're announcing on Good Morning Remax on Tuesday, by the way, we have put together with one of our suppliers showing kits for you, and they are uh, a sealed bag. Um, in fact, they're overnighting me one. I'll probably be here today. It's got a mask, gloves, a uh, little sanitizer white packet, and booties are back ordered across the country, but they will have booties in it. And it's a sealed pack branded Remax um, that we got. We bought 45,000 of them uh, that you guys can purchase. I think the pricing is around two dollars and fifty cents each for the package, two sixty-five, um, and you have to buy them in two hundred and fifty increments. So, Hadi, you could buy uh, you know a couple hundred and distribute how you want them. They're going to go fast. They're already taking pre-orders. So, Hadi, if you if you're interested, um, I'll send you a link uh, because what's cool, you could buy ten of them, throw them in your trunk, and if you're going out showing. You can just hand them to your buyers and they've got the mask, they've got their sanitizer, they've got their gloves, they've got everything that they need. Um, because these, as you know, these some of these things are in short supply and we know that they're going to be essential to you selling real estate and showing property. So we just wanted to make sure to have a solution that was easy for you. Um, so be on the lookout for those. Um, and that leads us into this. This is the new operational reality that we're going to have for the next few months. Uh, by the way, we've heard a lot of agents, a lot of brokers in six recessions, by the way, this is the very first time, very first time that SBA financing has been available to independent contractors and franchisees and that unemployment could be available for independent contractors. We've never had that. And so this is going to help our business quite a bit. And I've heard a lot of brokerages and a lot of agents already have received deposits. Um, and so that's going to be a, a good impact that is going to help a lot of people get through a short-term bump. Um, what's interesting about it, do you know last year as a whole, SBA financing put $39 billion for the entire year into the economy, 39. And now through this, it's, what's the total now? 650, $700 billion. Um, so just in comparison, the first week they launched it, $90 billion in, in SBA financing went out into the, mar into the economy, $90 billion in seven days, and 12 months the prior year, it was only 39. So there will be a lot of money pumped into this. And I, I, even though we've got, uh, gosh, 30, low 30 million um, unemployed, um, I saw a forecast the other day. and. You know how it varies, but I'm sticking with this one because I liked it the best. That it was an estimate that 90% of the people that lost their job, furloughed or unemployed, will be back employed by the fall. 90%. Like that would be so awesome. Um, and for our business, they also dissected it a little bit that 80% of the people that uh, lost their jobs were likely not home buyers. Um, and I thought that was interesting. I, um, so they believed that that would have less effect on buyers moving forward. So what can you be doing? I'm gonna push this so hard because I think this is so cool. You know, as an agent, I told you I'm an agent, had a closing, the first app. If you don't have it yet, download it. 
go to first.io, you see the uh, address there. We've made this free for all of you for 90 days. Um, and don't be afraid. I know it's going to ask you if you sign up to put your credit card in right now. Put a calendar reminder um, on your calendar for 89 days from now um, after you download it. And if you decide you don't like it, you can cancel and you won't be charged a thing. If you're not familiar with this, which I'm sure you are because Hadi is amazing about keeping you guys trained and informed um, and Karush. But um, the whole idea that you can just load your contacts in three minutes. I did mine. I started using it before we acquired the company. And it has 750 data points on every homeowner in the United States. So, Hadi, I have 750 data points on you. Um, I know what color socks you have on right now. Um, and it's scary, right? But it predicts who do you know that's going to list their house in the next six to 12 months. The real kicker on it is because you put in your MLS ID, it tells you when you've missed a listing, when someone in your phone lists their house with somebody else, it sends you a push notification. I just, uh, I have lost, and of course, you know, I don't actively list and sell, but even in my network, oh, I missed another one as of yesterday. Um, I have lost eight listings. I have 905 contacts in my phone and many of them, all I have is the cell number. That's it. And the cell phone number goes into the algorithm, tells me what house they own and uses the other 748 data points to predict if they're going to list. I have missed eight uh, listings. 5,419,000 in volume since October 24th. And so it's great. Our, the timing of this is just brilliant, guys. I'm telling you, here's why. Remember the chunk of sellers that have delayed putting their house on their market? They could already have picked an agent or they maybe have not. And I'll tell you what, I tell the story all the time. I had a heartbreaker when I first started selling real estate. 23 years old, two years after I started, I had sold a house to a couple, retired, they were awesome, loved them. I drove by and they had listed their house two years after they bought it with some other agent in the market. And it happened to be Connie, my nemesis. Like She's a lovely lady, but I hated her because I was always up against her in getting listings. Like we fought tooth and nail. Connie's sign was in the yard, I was furious. I saw the couple uh, literally uh, a couple weeks later and they saw me and you could tell they uh, sheepish and they and I realized it was it was not Connie's fault I didn't get the listing it was mine I had not sent them one follow-up on real estate I'd run into them in the community all the time but I never sent them anything about real estate and so when they started thinking about real estate Adam Contos our CEO has a saying and I love it whoever is top of mind is first in line and when they thought real estate, because they had talked to Connie about real estate, she was top of mind before me. And so agents lose 70% of listing opportunities out of their own database to somebody else. And right now is the chance that you can go in, play with this tool. It's so easy. It is so, so easy. Um, you do have to interface with the clients though. Um, it's not going to call your contacts for you. Um, but reach out because there are listings that people are sitting saying i'm gonna list and they are just waiting to put the sign in the yard two weeks from now four weeks from now depending on when they're comfortable showing their home and so you could likely i've already heard of agents i hear of testimonials every day from this thing that they just got a listing um, or just got two listings off of using this um, because they hadn't listed yet and so if you can plug this in and you can pick up one or two or three listings in the next two months, that's game changer for you. You'll come out of this um, with a good little uh, uptick. Um, okay, so what's gonna happen with the market? NAR is estimating, by the way, I never believe their numbers, but um, they are estimating that closings for the year will be down 10 to 15%. And Dr. Yun, I do respect him. Um, his latest is 14% is what will be down overall. That being said, if that is the case, though, 
I believe that some agents are going to have record years and outproduce last year, which was a record year, because some agents have furloughed themselves. They are not keeping their pipeline full. They are not contacting. They are not using first to figure out listings. And in some of the markets that opened up earlier than others, I was just on one um, of these in Florida yesterday, and several of the agents said this is the busiest they have been in two years. Because the pent-up demand, spring market, and it's all gonna happen very quickly. That, that summer spring market is gonna be compacted. And so be prepared. If you're not busy now and your showings have come up, uh, I think it's a great opportunity to pick off some business. Um, and that's where I think we will come out of this. I believe that agents that engage, you're gonna be a better agent to, uh, next month than you were last month. And when it comes to tech and some of these things, here was one that I thought was really terrific. Um, top producing team in our system had never used Zoom before and has been using it because we're forced to. Um, he said, I'm not comfortable on video, right? We don't like how we look and how we sound on video. Well, guess what? This has forced us to just do it. And now we're comfortable. He said he, when he does price reductions on his listings, he gets in his car because he goes face to face with the seller. He believes that price reductions are a face to face conversation, not a phone call. Um, and he said, I'm not doing that anymore. I'm going to use Zoom so I can be face to face with my seller to do a price reduction. And he said, I ended up an hour, hour and a half in the car. And to go there and either back to the office or back home, he said, if I do two or three price reductions a week, that can be two, three, four hours of my schedule. And he said, I can maybe do it via Zoom and I can do all of it in 45 minutes. And so the difference in my mind of a mediocre producer and a top producer is efficiency. And if one of our top producers can use Zoom to do price reductions and get two to three hours back in their schedule every week, they maybe can uh, get two or three more clients and get four or five more closings for the year. So I know tech can be overwhelming. It can. And it's what should you use because there's so many options, right? Makes our minds blow. I would say this. My advice is find one or two things that you can pull into your business coming out of this that will make you a little more efficient. And I'll give you one more. Um, virtual tours are not going away even when we start doing more showings in person. The idea of how consumers look at real estate online has come a long way, but I think it's gonna continue to get better. Was talking with my friends from London and they said, by the way, you guys in the US are way behind on how you market real estate. And I said, what? We are behind on anything, we lead here. And he said, no, the way you do photography on listings is way behind in the US from what we do. And I said, tell me more, here's what they require. And they have a name for it. And I'm sorry, I can't remember the, the, the word that they, they, they reference this. But when you shoot photos of the interior of a house, it is required, I have a big window here on, on, in my office at home. It is required if I was photographing this, this office, uh, the blinds would have to be open and you would have to be able to see the outside within the photo. Because have you ever gone to that listing that looks beautiful online and you walk in and you look out the back window and the neighbor's house is right here, but you sure couldn't tell that when you looked online? So they have put requirements in place that when you photograph the inside of the house, it has to feel like you're living in it or standing in it. And if there are windows, you have to be able to show what it feels to see the outside. And I went, this is not a difficult concept. We show pictures of the inside of the house, professional, we make them as beautiful as can be. And then we go on the outside of the house and we photograph it, but we really don't create photographs that make you feel like you're sitting in this room looking out the window. I think it's I think it's awesome. And he showed me examples of it, and it really does make a difference of how you view the house online. Um, it's not gonna be a requirement in the US anytime soon, but I think it's brilliant that um, we need to teach it within Remax 
because guess what? If we can if we can take that learning from our friends in London and Australia does the same thing, um, all of a sudden now, if we adopted it, we can make our Remax listings look better than the competition online. More showings, more contracts, drives more business to you. Those are the little tweaks that I think we're gonna see come out of this that are going to be lasting in our business and make us much, much stronger um, and better moving forward. So that was a lot. I can ramble for hours. I'll pause. Um, if you have questions, comments, thoughts. Nick, um, thank you so much. This was awesome. Let me ask you a couple of questions that agents have brought up regarding first because we have been pushing it but um we've had some pushback because they're saying well you know this person was somebody i just sold a house to or that person you know uh they moved from the area so there are a lot of issues which i understand that because you know obviously you got the whole database you got all your contact in there so there's going to be some miss uh, uh i guess leads can you kind of uh, go over that a little bit as far as the accuracy? Yeah, here's the thing, when you take, that's a great question, when you take 750 points of data, um, a lot of it is their online search activity. That's weighted pretty heavy in the algorithm. And so um, I know one of one of our uh, very good friends, in fact, we're getting together with them, our kids are friends tomorrow night. Um, the wife is an absolute real estate junkie. Now she's not a real estate agent, but my wife and her husband roll their eyes at us because when we get together, um, her and I start going, oh, did you see this house and this house and what about this house? She comes up as a potential seller for me all the time because that's how she spends her free time is on websites looking at houses. So in her algorithm within the first app, she always ranks high for me. Um, and so, but she's not interested in selling. Here's the deal, 905 contacts in my phone. I mean, Hottie's in my phone. I'm not gonna be his agent because he lives 2000 miles from me. Um, so he still might rank high, but it doesn't make sense. So here's the deal though. If my, my friends that we talk about that uh, she's a real estate junkie online all the time, within the app, of course, um, if I reach out to her and call her or say, hey, by the way, how are you doing? Just checking in and is real estate on your mind? Um, because by the way, demand is so high, especially right now. Um, now's not a time to actually sell. It's more to serve. How are you? It's more of a personal check in on truly, truly genuine. How are you doing? Um, and if it leads to real estate, great. But as we're starting now to come out of this, even Jared James on Good Morning Remax said the other day, now it's okay on your social media to say, hey, I'm a realtor. Now it's okay to reach out and say, Hey, by the way, um, what are you thinking about really? How's your house? You've been stuck in your house for a couple of months. Are you thinking about uh, a change or not? Because we've got a lot of buyer activity out there. Introduce that activity and conversation. And if they say, no, we're good, then you're going to say they're not interested at this time in the app and they're going to fall out of your opportunity. So is it perfect that it actually knows every single person 100 percent the answer is no we still have to do our job as the trusted advisor as the agent and we got to engage with these people um, and find out if they're interested in selling but i will just tell you in my personal experience i've been standing on stage the last few months and i've been telling this story about ellen woods um, her husband was a coach for the denver broncos um, went to the 49ers and uh, now he just went to the Cleveland Browns. And by the way, using a Remax agent to buy their house. Um, Ellen's son and my son, they just live down the street. They're in the same class together and they play together all the time. She is in my top four and has been since I started using this as a potential seller. Well, of course, online activity, but I know her husband's getting moving around. Guess what happened on Monday this week? She listed the house, $1.7 million. And she's in my top four. So as I have watched this, there are people that I know that we're going to list. We have a headquarters employee that I came back to Remax. She was number one on my opportunity. She was my assistant for seven years when I worked at Remax the first time. And I said, Kim, how are you? Oh my gosh, it's so good to see you. And she said, I have a secret. I said, what? 
She said, my husband and I are moving to Florida. I haven't told my boss yet, so don't tell him. And I'm hoping they'll let me keep my job and work remote. Um, and I said, oh, are you going to sell the house? And she said, yeah, we haven't listed it yet. She was number one opportunity on my list. And sure enough, told her boss, stayed with the company. She's now moved to Florida and the house was for sale. So long-winded way to answer your question. But yes, there is accuracy and I've seen it personally. Uh, that leads me to the next question that uh, um, I was going to ask you. I don't know why I want to get feedback here. Uh, but I was going to ask you, uh, since you are with Zillow and I see that a lot of agents are kind of going away from Zillow, if you were to compare what they pay to get leads from Zillow versus the first, um, as far as uh, the comparison, and they're probably not comparison, but people buying leads uh, online leads all the time. So my question yeah. is, which one, because this is the cost when it becomes, um, when they have to pay for it after 90 days, is really minimal compared to what they pay a Zillow type um, lead generation system. So how That's would right. you compare the two? So here's what I'll say, number one, people ask me all the time, where should I get leads if you need leads? Number one is, or where should you invest? If you're gonna spend money on leads, spend money where you get results. And that can differ. I can walk into one company and an agent says, oh my gosh, I love Zillow, I got X number, I spend $5,000 a month with them, but it works. The next agent says, I hate Zillow, I would never work with them, I think they're disgusting, and I love Realtor.com. I mean, it, it varies all across the board. So you have to use what works for your business. At the same time, Costs per lead on most online platforms are in the hundreds of dollars just for the lead, not the guaranteed business. When we bought first, uh, the price was $149 a month. Uh, we immediately reduced it to $39 a month for Remax agents. If you're on, if you agree to do a year, it's $59 a month. If you do um, month to month. However, here's how I look at it: for $39 a month. If you get one closing a year, what's your average commission right now on a side? Hadi, 6,000, 7,000? Is that maybe average on a side? On the side, you're talking about uh, overall. I think we are like 2.8% uh, on the one side. So in other words, uh, the commission is usually 6%. But, and your average uh, price is good, what going to be in the threes? Our, yeah, our Remax executive is about 3.30. Okay, um, 0.028, oh, so 9,800. So you're gonna be a little higher than I thought. Uh, okay, so your average commission like $8,000. Uh, if you ended up investing in this tool for an entire year and spent 500 bucks to get 8,000, that's a pretty good return. Um, but I, I, I continue to tell people, you know, if you're looking for leads and you wanna increase your business, this is why we acquired this company because as a realtor myself, and you can tell I'm passionate about this tool, this is not because we're Remax. <laughs> this is because I'm a realtor and when I saw it, I said, we have to have this. This will change the lives of Remax agents um, because we want it proprietary. Um, so the other thousand agents that had it in other companies, like we're turning off uh, and this will be only available to Remax agents. Uh, but I think that's a pretty good return. I mean, even if you got one listing a year off of it and sold it, worth it, and it's going to be the cost per lead is thirty nine dollars. Um, so I I think it's low, and I keep telling people all the time: if you need more business, don't be surprised how much business is in this device that's sitting in your hand. I don't think you have to buy leads from anywhere if you didn't have to. Um, you could probably just dig into this device and have enough business. I mean, I look at, I've missed eight deals, five and a half million dollars in volume just since October 24th. And I'm not an active agent, but if you, if you put that, I can't wait to see October 24th of this year, how many deals I missed. My estimate is going to be between 12 and $18 million in volume. Folks, if you're doing $18 million in volume, that's a good income and you're a good agent. So if I can get $18 million of listings out of the device right now, that's incredible. 
Like, have I sold you on this thing? I mean, I am sold. I mean, I truly. <laughs> I mean, I know that you probably had a lot to do with us buying it, so I'm definitely sold. The first time I saw it, 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 it was great. my baby. It was my baby yeah, project I the when CEO I came back. Of the company, the, you know, I I met them. They're from Durham, and they're really nice guys, and they're smart guys. So I do believe uh, that it's a fantastic tool. So, um, but you know, oh, good. And Karush mentioned hi right here in the chat. He's working with Kent and Mike. Mike's is the CEO. Both Kent and Mike, they are smart guys. Um, yeah. And they're going to do a special webinar just for your company. Yeah, that's awesome. Okay, I'm going to let um, other people to come in and ask questions. I think you got some stuff on the chat box. Sarah, you want to go over those? Um, I don't see any questions in here right now, but if anyone has any questions, feel free to unmute as well. Um, okay, I'm, I got I got a list of stuff, but I was gonna let some other people ask questions. But you know how agents are shy. You know me, Nick. I'm not shy. So no, I know. <laughs> Trust me, I've known you a uh, long time. Uh, so tell me, how are the competition dealing with this? Because you know I see a lot of stuff in social media. We're doing a lot of stuff. I mean, lots, lots of stuff. I don't see anybody. Everybody's quiet. They're like. They're hiding or they're missing. So what are you seeing out there? Well, it's one, I keep telling people, don't be invisible. Just don't be invisible right now. Um, top of mind, first in line. I will say this, we are so fortunate that Dave and Gillinger have you know, been through this for five decades and we have run the brand and our headquarters in a really conservative manner. And so as soon as this happened, it was like us getting Zoom accounts. We got free Zoom accounts for every brokerage. We have 8,500 offices on the globe and 132,000 agents. And we got those lit up immediately because we knew this was gonna be part of it, um, that we needed to communicate. And so all we did is immediately go in and say, this is not a time to cut services for agents. This is the time when we need to extend our hand of services to agents. And we cut a whole bunch of things that you guys don't know about because my goal was to keep our cuts out of the headlines. And we wanted to make sure that the goal was to give you any tool you needed um, to do your business in any way you could now. And, and we have pretty significant cash reserves. We're publicly held, we just had earnings. So if you wanna know what it is, I mean, it's no secret. And, and so we watched immediately our competition, slash staff, cut services. Um, and we knew that this was likely going to be a very deep, fast fall, one of the fastest in real estate history, and it will likely be one of the fastest recoveries back. So we knew that it was gonna be a very compressed cycle. And here's the challenge. You cut services and you cut staff, the market comes back as strong as it was right before we got into this, and you're sitting with 25, 30% less staff, it's gonna to be tough to run your business. Um, and a lot of these new business models that have come out in the last few years, by the way, they're not tried and true on both sides of buyer's market, seller's market. They haven't lived through it. We're going to see some of these companies don't open their doors again. And there's been a lot of money poured into the real estate industry in the last couple of years for technology, um, some new brokerages, billions and billions and billions of dollars. And it's like the, the hose was just on. Well, you, you turn that hose off and they've never been profitable. Never. There are companies that have been around in our industry for four or five years, and they have continued quarter over quarter over quarter losses. And I'm sorry, I, you can't lose $48 million a quarter, and at some point not expect to, to wake up one day and the piggy bank's a little empty. Uh, and I think that's what they're gonna experience. So uh, we're just leaning on our learnings from the past and, um, some of the competition, this is the very first time they're learning this. As far as iBuyers, you know, they've disappeared. 
And uh, so what do you think the future of iBuyers? Are they coming back, you think? I think some will. You know, if you were at R4 for Good Morning Remax and I had um, the uh, former president of Zillow as a guest and we were talking about this and consolidation has been on our minds. And so I think that's what we're going to have. I think Open Door and Zillow offers are going to be your two players. I think a lot of the rest are going to fall away or get absorbed. Um, so I do think that they are somewhat here to stay. But here's what's interesting about it. Um, I want more and more of them to come out because it reminds me of AVMs, like Zestimate, the automated valuation. When Zestimate was the only one that people looked at, that was one thing. And it didn't matter how accurate or inaccurate it was. Now, all of a sudden, you have all of these different automated valuation um, products out there. And so a homeowner goes on, and it's on Remax.com. We did it intentionally. Go out and look at it. We put three on there. And by the way, when we launched the new Remax.com, wow, did we get beat up, especially me since I worked at Zillow, because the Zestimate is on Remax.com. And said, why would you do that? That is awful. I hate Zillow, and why are we putting the Zestimate on the site? And I said, because you got to realize whether you love it or hate it, consumers like it. And if consumers like it, if they come to our site and it's not there, that means they're going to leave our site and go somewhere else. I'd rather them stay on the site and see it and send a lead to one of you. And so we have three AVMs on Remax.com. And you will see one of them says the house is worth $490. The next one says it's worth $410. And the next one says it's worth 460. And you see right below, if you want the real value, click here. And that's where we send you a lead. And so the same thing is happening in the iBuyer space. Uh, my friends that I uh, sold their house I told you about, I went to Open Door and Zillow Offers and got them two cash offers. And then I also got them three offers through MLS. So I presented them with all five. It was a $675,000 house. Um, do you know between Zillow and Open Door, their offers were a hundred thousand dollars different? One hundred thousand. So here's what's going to happen with iBuyers: the consumer is going to come to you and say, "Zillow just offered me six thirty. Open Door offered me five twenty. What should I do?" And I'll tell you what: I think we're going to come out pretty bold, Remax, and we're going to say that we stand for homeowner equity. Because the service fees on iBuyers are anywhere from 7 to 15%. And we get beat up for our 6%? Come on. And they're leaving equity on the table. And so iBuyers are interlopers. They are coming in. They're grabbing part of the seller's equity. They are putting white countertops and gray paint on and then profiting from it. They're absolutely an interloper that is not great for a seller and not great for us. What they have proven is this though, transacting is still painful to a buyer or seller. And that's where we have to lead and use technology to make the a process of under, con under contract to close easier for a consumer. That's what we have to solve for. That's what's driving iBuyers is, oh my gosh, I can close my house in 15 days and I don't have to make my bed or vacuum and it's just done and if their tech platforms are using e-signature and it makes it super easy um, we can do that with non not uh, um, i buyers but i kept saying i buying is one thing you can buy houses and keep doing this in a seller's market but the line just has to keep going like this and the minute the line goes like this you're going to see i buyers dry up and that's exactly what happened um, and so if, if values do fall or they don't accelerate month over month, it crashes their business model. Well, thank you so much. Um, anybody has any questions? Don't be shy. This is your chance. I, actually, I've got one in the chat. Oh, well, go ahead and ask since, uh, you're talking right now. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, this is great information. I really appreciate it. Um, my situation is um, many, many years in a global business and now in real estate. So my database is largely across the U.S. and around the world. I wonder if you could speak 
briefly or quickly to the use of first and referrals? Oh, you bet. What a what a great question. What a great idea. Even if you're interacting with those people, you know, I talked about Hadi's not my client because he's 2,000 miles away. Um, but yeah, could you interact with them and say, hey, how are you doing? And just checking in and um, get the real estate conversation going. And the beautiful part of being with Remax, my gosh, I mean, to be able to say, because we have a huge footprint. I mean, being all around the world, every market, and especially in the US, uh, is to say, if you have real estate needs, um, I'm happy to connect you and and do referrals with it. That's a great idea. Um, you absolutely could do that. Yeah, that's what I thought. I just wanted to make sure that the, the algor algorithms of the 700 and something touch points um, work in a global context. Yeah, they're only going to work in the U.S. The data that we have is only for U.S. Um, we're looking at data sources. Canada has different privacy laws, and so we're trying to light up the tool for Canada um, by the end of this year. Uh, but if you do have global contacts, um, granted, if they were in the U.S. and relocating globally, then it's great. If you're looking for data on people that are living outside of the U.S., not going to be there. Won't be accurate for those people. Okay, that's kind of what I thought. So if, if they upload anyway, they just won't rise to the top. They'll just, okay. That's right. But, but the U.S. is still great. I mean, um, you know, that's, a, that's a still uh, going to be very beneficial things. Yeah, and be careful with your dialogues, folks. Like, don't call people and say, hey, I know what color your socks are, and I've got 750 data points on you. <laughs> um, then it's creepy. So some people are uncomfortable with this because they say it is a little creepy. It's not. It's not at all. What it is, is sometimes, by the way, I know many of you have experienced this. Have you ever seen a situation when someone's, a couple is going to list the house? And by the way, the one spouse doesn't even know it yet. I mean, think about it. I, I see that all the time. There are cus, um, couples, husband, wives, or significant others that one knows that hey, we're selling this place and I haven't, I haven't told my husband yet. Uh, and they're out already finding a, new, finding a new house and the husband has no idea that their house is going on the market in three weeks. And so that's what's kind of interesting about it is it's not creepy. It's a matter of us reaching out. And if they say, oh my gosh, that's great. Yeah, uh, you know, I'm actually starting to search and I haven't told <laughs> so-and-so yet. I mean, there have been real life testimonials on that. So um, it's not creepy. I think they actually appreciate when you reach out um, because you're you're actually helping what their needs are. Well, thank you so much, uh, Nick. I know you probably got five more Zoom meetings today. So, and I don't know if you had your breakfast yet, but I know it's. A couple I, hours haven't. <laughs> so, I haven't. I anyway, haven't. But thank you so much. It was uh, it's always fun to have you. Uh, join our webinar hopefully we'll have you again and uh, maybe we we'll see you in person somewhere um, i know i was scheduled to come see you this summer um hadi and i had I, set up. I was going to come out in person and hang out with you and so we'll get it back on the calendar um sure. hadi you've got a guaranteed reservation um whenever you need it we'll just figure out the date i love coming out okay. to hang with you parting words is this if you haven't thanked your broker recently do these guys make running a brokerage look easy, and it's not. And especially in a downturn like this, they're carrying a lot on their shoulders. And um, they do amazing things. And I'll tell you what, Hadi knows I'm a huge fan. Karush, I'm a huge fan. I absolutely mean it. You run on a wonderful business. You do wonderful things for your agents. Um, and they're just lucky to have you. Well, thank you so much, Nick. I appreciate it. Thanks, Laura, for being here. And uh, guys, thanks. And we'll talk to you soon. Be well, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye.